I always forget to let the soundtrack and my intro music lead me in. How's everybody doing? I did not show my normal video intro today because we're running a little late and I wanted to make sure we got right into uh, our, our guest today. But uh, there's the end of the intro. I wanted to say hopefully everybody's staying safe. Everybody's staying healthy. Everybody is staying inside right now, obviously, with everything going on. And this isn't the type of show to get political or to start talking about all the things that I truly believe in, which is peaceful protesting, which I believe should be happening and is happening. But there's a lot of looting, a lot of crazy stuff going on, even down here where my office is. And uh, so I want to just make sure everyone knows that you should be safe, you should be healthy, you should be staying inside. And let's get everybody calm down here. And um, let's, let's get back to the point where we can actually work on uh, a, a very restrained and very peaceful protest against the horrible things that have happened between the police and the African-American community for many, many years, regardless of also what happened last week. So that's what I wanted to say about that. I don't want to get way into the weeds on everything because, you know, that's not this type of show. Chicago Music Revealed. I'm Mike Jeffers, Chicago Jazz Magazine, chicagojazz.com. But I am glad because our guest today, John Bailey, came out with a new recording. And this this sort of uh, this sort of um, all ties together. And I like the fact that we're going to be talking to John about this because the name of the recording is Can You Imagine? And John, welcome to the show and thank you for being on. And I think that what we're going to talk about today in regards to your rec your latest recording that came out in January actually still is very, very important today, and it ties in perfectly, but we're going to talk specifically about this incredible recording you have. So how are you doing? I'm doing okay, Mike. As good how as we you, can man? do, right? As good as we can do here. Yeah, yeah, we're hanging in, and we're fighting the fight, man. So now, for everybody to know, John's located in New York. He's uh, not in downtown, but he's up in, uh, not Manhattan or one of the boroughs, right? You're You're just outside of the city, right? No, I actually I live in New York City, but I'm not there now. My oh, okay. my wife and child and I we we um we vacated the city March 13th uh, on Friday night when we lost all of our work and my son got kind of locked out of school. And we have a little place up here in Dutchess County outside of Poughkeepsie, mm -hmm. and that's where we are. Well, excellent. Well, I'm glad you could join us today, and I'm glad we're talking about this incredible recording. As I said before, we came on. Uh, I listened to. Um, a majority of the tracks i really dig it and i think that just listening to the tracks we're going to talk about the concept behind it and i want you to go in depth into that but i mean i can tell that dizzy gillespie and a lot of these other famous world famous trumpet players that all of the uh, you know history of trump tr jazz trumpet has been influenced by influenced you because i could hear a lot of different styles a lot of different genres throughout this entire recording which i thought was really interesting good listen to listen to so why don't we talk though about the concept behind this recording and uh, you know what how it came about well um around about 2016 i witnessed as we all witnessed the pendulum swinging after um well let's face it uh the white or part of white america's reaction to eight years of a black president and i couldn't help but thinking about this even though this pendulum has swung and the white supremacists who were not really um, in the forefront weren't really being heard are now being heard. And, oh, man, there they are. And, the, you know, we knew they were there all along, didn't we? Mm -hmm. So so here we go. Right. So I, I kept thinking about Dizzy because it turns out that Dizzy Gillespie, the great jazz trumpet player, John Burks Gillespie, ran for president in 1964, for real. And this is a reminder that we live in a great country because had enough people written his name into the ballot, John Burks Gillespie would have become the first black president in 1964. That's right. And so what I kept thinking about over and over and over is would we have, with him serving as the catalyst that Barack Obama served as, all those years before, would we be further along as a culture today? And that became sort of the theme of the record mm -hmm. because Dizzy Gillespie was a great humanitarian. Dizzy Gillespie ran for president to fight for, for um, 
world peace, to fight for uh, racial equality in America, to fight for um, and to raise money for CORE. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> these were all great causes. And lest we forget that Dizzy was the first jazz ambassador back from 1957. To, right. the, to America. So this is a, and you know, then later on, of course, he had the United Nations Orchestra, and we're talking about an immensely talented human being who came of age from South Carolina to New York City and revolutionized American music. Not just bebop, but Latin jazz as well. He considered the, the godfather of Latin jazz. Mm-hmm. So that's the premise of the record, and I just started thinking about. You know, the tune I Can Dream, Can't I, by Sammy Fain, which Clifford recorded in the 50s, and thinking that, you know what, this is a big dream of mine, like, this is a dreamy fantasy. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to make a song, and I'm going to call it, I'm going to use the changes of I Can Dream, Can't I, and I'm going to call the song President Gillespie's Birthday Song. <laughs> That's how this album was born. <laughs> it ended up being turning turning into a suite in three movements. But uh, anyway, well, there it is in a nutshell. Well, I'll tell you, I you know it's 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 quite a concept, by the way. I mean, I I, 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 lo- <laughs> I, I love it, you know. But but really, when you think about it, and what you just described, and I mean, you know, obviously, you know, myself being a drummer, a jazz drummer, and everything. Obviously, you know, I've listened to know all of dizzy's recordings and and followed them and stuff but you brought up a great point that i think sometimes gets lost maybe on the casual music fan or even so you know a jazz fan that's not totally in depth into dizzy's whole life uh but boy he was so inclusive and it, he could have been that guy that just played concerts did whatever he did and and would have been hugely successful but he went out of his way to include people and to constantly seek out other people and other ways and other other um, other cultures to include them with him in order to broaden their uh, listening ability. Right. I mean, he just the, the, the whole the whole when he you know went to Cuba and everything. I mean, he really opened up that entire country to the United States because before that, it really it, it wasn't as prominent. Yeah, he really understood that this is really world music. Yeah. You know, that it's American music, and American music represents world music, the mm-hmm. melting pot of everyone from every culture coming together and sharing their musical ideas and making a new art form out of it. And he was the one of the central figures in it. Yeah, he, so. he, he well, he was a catalyst of, of a lot of things, and you're right. I mean, that that's really truly what he ended up doing. And, and I mean, just, you know, without going down the, the, the wormhole here, but I mean, just think about all of the artists that might not have been really known to any of us if it wasn't for Dizzy, for him bringing them into his band and mentoring them. And, uh, you know, and then they went on to have hugely successful careers. So, I mean, just the, just the scope of right. what Dizzy did... Um, just from a music standpoint, no matter what I mean, genre it was, it's incredible. I mean, you just Lee Morgan, you just start with him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. people, a lot of people for a long time thought that, you know, that until they looked carefully or, or read the liner notes that that was Dizzy playing in the front of Manteca mm-hmm. at Newport. I wasn't, that was 17 year old Lee Morgan. Isn't that unbelievable? So a great, a great example of that. And of course, Dizzy much more than just a trumpet player, right? Much more than just a composer much more than just a great American. Mm-hmm. He was, those of us who are of a certain age, we actually got to meet Dizzy and we actually, <laughs> we actually got to like see him on television along with Ella and all these great, great artists. And anytime Dizzy walked into a room, he, he just, he was incredibly charismatic mm-hmm. and he lit up the room, you know? Yeah. yeah. Everybody was a better person for him being in the room. Mm-hmm. So, Anyway, well, I, I remember we just since, since we're talking about Dizzy, I, I happen to uh, be lucky enough to work with Joe Siegel, the founder of the Chicago Jazz Showcase. Absolutely. And sure. uh, he and I did his book, which came out two years ago. And so I was with Joe for two years working on this. And he threw a birthday party for Dizzy at the old club on uh, Rush Street for, you know, because he knew Dizzy forever. And uh, oh, my gosh, did he have stories and stuff. But I mean, <laughs> Dizzy was so approachable to everybody. And I think that that, you know, it, it just passed on the jazz tradition to a lot of people that might not have been influenced by it. So the fact that you've got this new recording called Can You Imagine? 
Uh, it's it's really an incredible concept. But before we came on, we were talking about it's not really a tribute to Dizzy. It was the Can You Imagine thinking about that. So why don't we talk a little bit about the tunes that are on this and some of the, uh, you know, how did you go about developing the repertoire for this? Um, well, I I wanted to write three or four tunes. I ended up writing The Suite, which is really three tunes, and then a, a couple of others. Um, so as far as my originals, you've got The Blues House, Mm-hmm. And which, by the way, was one of one of Dizzy's campaign promises. If he got elected president, he would change the name of the White House to the Blues House. <laughs> so that's the Blues I, House. Which did, is I blues read it, a reading in your reading in, in some info on the album. I mean, was he really thinking about having Miles Davis be the head of the CIA? Yeah, Miles is head of the CIA. <laughs> oh, uh, Louis Armstrong is head of agriculture, <laughs> yeah. and um, <laughs> and um, yeah, that was that was pretty funny. Um, of, of, of course, inundated with with just tons of humor, and then very serious as a heart attack. Just need to encapsulate Dizzy. Dizzy would crack a joke, you know, just mm-hmm. like Louis Armstrong. By the way, he would crack a joke. And then when he put the horn to his face, anytime you see him play, he's serious as a heart attack. Oh, yeah. Yep. You know, I mean, absolutely stoic, mm-hmm. like a rock, you know, and he's playing straight ahead. He's moving around while he's playing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That tells everything right there. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, Pebbles in the Pocket, this is a tune I wrote that I just wanted to write a fast mobile, modal tune and have a little fun with it. Um, and the title came about because of a friend of mine that's on this record who referred to pebbles of wisdom that he had received from his parents, uh, his deceased father in particular. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how he just kind of carries around these pebbles of wisdom. So the tune is pebbles of wisdom, you know, which we should all heed. Absolutely. Um, And then the President Gillespie Sweet is a humanitarian candidate, obviously. Mm -hmm. Road to the Blues House featuring the great Earl McIntyre on bass trombone uh plunder trombone because he used to play with taj mahal and he's got a whole thing mm-hmm. so yeah we featured him on that which is a a vamp when the the backgrounds for that that movement are um volunteered slavery by ross on roland kirk mm-hmm. and the theme to that you hear as a background and you see uh do yourself a favor Mm-hmm. educate your mind get yourself together hey there ain't much time that's a stevie wonder lyric mm-hmm. from where i'm coming from <laughs> and then we start quoting all the all the cabinet picks you know a little walk in for a little walking in there a little duke ellington um then we get into um president gillespie's birthday song mm-hmm. which again it's just a celebration we have a little fun tune number three touch of her vibe this is a beautiful tune by victor lewis um and um let's see oh ballad from oro incencio y mira mm-hmm. this is a tune that chico o'farrell uh wrote which is a part of a suite on an album called afro cuban jazz moods by machito mm-hmm. and i took this i actually had an opportunity to play this with the afro lab jazz orchestra at the apollo wow. and i just fell in love with this thing i got like hang 10 out there in front of a big orchestra and <laughs> you know, played this inspired man. It was something else. So I extracted the ballad and made, you know, basically Chico's arrangement. It's basically just a transcription. Uh, Stacy Dillard wrote this beautiful tune, Elite State of Mind, which he wrote back in 2006, and he repurposed for this record. So that's a, that's a really beautiful yeah. one, too. Uh, Valso Rancho. This is where you have to uh, check out Elise Regina and the music of Brazil. Mm-hmm. So I always put one of Elise's tunes from her songbook. It's not her tune. It's Francis Hines' tune. But we did a little transcription, and I owe that one to um, Cesar Mariano, who was her husband and accompanist. And we let Stacy go crazy at the end. From the Heart is another Victor Lewis original. And that's a great one that really goes back. And again, it's because he heard he wrote this one years ago. He's working on it. And he wrote it after hearing Ross on Roland Kirk play. So this is how it's all kind of tying in. Now, the last tune on the record is People. People made famous by Barbra Streisand. Mm -hmm. But what very few people know, Mike, is that this tune was recorded live at Carnegie Hall at Newport Jazz Festival in 1973. 
really? the very end of a concert by Ella Fitzgerald. Just Ella and Tommy Flanagan oh, as wow. a duo. And let me tell you, Lucille Armstrong is in the front row. And uh, she she does her arrangement of it. And she finishes up and she point, you can hear her, feel her pointing to Lucille um, while she's singing the lyrics at the end. So I had this record as a kid because my sisters growing up had, you know, they were singers and musicians and stuff. And so I've listened to this thing since I was about 11. And I decided I'm just going to do a transcription of this, this version of people. Mm-hmm as an homage to Ella and to tie into this record to the, the whole concept, which is, hey, listen, there's some beautiful people out there we can vote for for president in 2020 and have the opportunity to do so many, many years ago as well. Mm-hmm. And people who are interested in social justice, people are interested in world peace, people are interested in having a world culture like Izzy did. Mm-hmm. So you're really letting me go on and on. I should I should let you time. Well, in no, I hey, I, it's fascinating because I think it's interesting, uh, you know, the whole concept of it. But the fact that you've got well, Victor Lewis contributed two tracks, right? Two two tunes to this recording. So it was really um, almost a, a, a collaboration on your part with the different guys that you were working with. Are these all? Uh, talk a little bit about the guys in the band, Victor Victor Lewis, obviously. Well, but, yeah. You know, well, first of all, all all the records that I would like to make and have i've only made two records as a leader but i always like it to be kind of like a band record mm-hmm. instead of like a record where it's like here's a trumpet player out front and uh, you're gonna you know right. we're gonna showcase him and i'm gonna solo on every tune and it's all all my, all my original composition <laughs> but, uh, i mean yeah come on i mean these, there's some great musicians in the world let's 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 make a band record so uh you know victor's been on both of my records um and I just love him, you know. I mean, anybody oh, knows yeah. Victor knows he's yeah. got the same spirit as Dizzy did, you know. It's just an absolutely unpretentious, beautiful human being, who is all about team ball when it plays, and those are his words too, team mm-hmm. ball. You know, we play, we play, we have to play the music together. Whatever happens, happens, man. You know, <laughs> it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be great if we're all on, on the same page. That's right. You know, that's right. That's, what, a, that's what a concept, what right? What a. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, You're, as a drummer, you know it. Uh, Stacy's has got the most beautiful sound in the world, and he's an incredibly natural musician. And uh, every time I play with him, there's magic happens every time, you know. Yeah. So yeah. I need him. I need him by my side. Yeah. And for that matter, if I'm going to expand to um, a sextet, I need Stafford Hunter on the other side of me because he's another really incredible, intuitive musician. Um, and they're great ensemble players, and they're great soloists and their team players. Mm-hmm. So then you get to the rhythm section, Etzel. How can you go wrong with Etzel Gomez, right? That's right. Puerto Rican guy who lived in Brazil for 10 years, you know, and lives in New York and plays jazz music. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> get me Etzel Gomez. Yeah, the bass player on this record is a really interesting has a really interesting history. I've known him since we were 17 years old, but he was playing tenor saxophone. I'm talking about Mike Karn. Mike Karn was a tenor saxophone player for years and years. And along the way, he just found himself evolving as a bass player. He became a bass player. And he was hard to get. I almost couldn't get him because you know what his gig is? What's that? He He works with John Pizzarelli. Oh, okay. He's John Pizzarelli's bass player. He's constantly on and the John, road, usually. Right? Constantly on the road. Yeah. I mean, I had to like extract him, like like to the <laughs> rehearsals and the, you know, and then off he was, you know, again, you know, on the road. So uh, then we have my special guest, um, Earl McIntyre, playing on playing a couple mm-hmm. tunes and playing tuba on the chorale of Oro and Cecilia Vienna, and um, Janet Axelrod playing flute on a couple of the tunes, just melodies and stuff like that. How, how, so that rounds it out. How important, I mean, uh, all right, so looking over your bio, you've been on over 75 recordings, right? I mean, two yeah. of yours. <laughs> yeah, but, right. But, <laughs> 77, though. Yeah, but I mean, when, when you're looking at that, all of that recording experience, I mean, obviously you've come into, you know, a, a thing, and here's the parts, play this, here it is, in and out, and then you've probably been a part of, different recordings with different groups that it's more along the lines of what you did with your recording. But I always feel like, especially with jazz, especially with something that's like this, where there's a lot of improvisation, a lot of playing off of each other, a lot of, 
you know, cooperation to get the same thing happening and everything moving in the right direction and everybody being able to be as creative as possible because everybody is supporting them. I mean, how important is that as a leader to to make sure you've got those right guys around you to get the most out of the song selections that you're selecting for the recording? Because I'm always curious for somebody like yourself has won two Grammys and everything. I mean, you've been on all these recordings, but I mean, there has to be some recordings that you probably left the recording session and went, you know, it could have been a lot better if we were all kind of chiming in because there might have been a few things I might have changed, but I didn't feel comfortable saying something as opposed to the setting that you set up for this recording where you're probably like, yeah, you know, everybody's kind of giving and taking and, and pushing the music forward. Yeah, you know, as a as a sideman for so many years, you see all kinds of different band leaders and you know, I was I was a sideman for 30 years mm-hmm. plus. And so you see you you see people who don't lead enough. You see people who are taskmasters and that has an effect on the music. Um and then of course what you you just said here, you know, when the 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 after effect of you know the immediate after effect of a, of a take yeah you know you do take one and you have different reactions from different people you got the disappointed guy you've got the guy who's enamored with himself you've got the the school of people who immediately want to go on the booth and listen to themselves and then you've got the other guys <laughs> who's going to go smoke a cigarette you know and i've taken the latter of them i don't really like to, to go in because you know paralysis by analysis man i yeah. mean you go in start critiquing yourself well then what are you going to get next take maybe if you're not really super sound you know psychologically you might be more technically proficient but less soulful you know mm-hmm. so so you got to weigh in all of those things you got to you got to be a leader and task master when it's necessary and you got to let people play yeah you know which i would always like to take the ladder of that mm-hmm. you know, let people play but know what you want you know, have specific ideas, have be organized, know what you exactly what you want. Don't be afraid because Victor Lewis told me something. The first thing he told me before we played a note in my band, let me know if you hear something that you absolutely hate. <laughs> 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 and this, this was almost by virtue to loosen me up to say, mm-hmm. listen, man, I work for you. You know, I, I want to know what you want. Yep. You know, yep. you know, it's interesting because I, I've I've asked this question to a, a few musicians who have played with. Well, for an example, just recently, John Primer, right, who was a world right. famous blues guitarist, who was Muddy Waters guitar player for 15 years and Willie Dixon yeah. and all that. And I asked yeah. I asked him, I said, you know, how when you walked in to play with Muddy and you were playing, I mean, were you like worried about like hey man you know am i playing the right stuff am i thinking about it or whatever and you know he basically told me you know if i really played something that wasn't happening i'd hear about it <laughs> and i would yeah, fix it exactly <laughs> yeah, and, and and you probably shouldn't ask you know <laughs> right yeah, exactly. yeah <laughs> it would behoove you to walking. stay silent yeah exactly. right <laughs> but uh, you know it's interesting yeah. to me because somebody like you i mean what yet when i was reading up on your bio i mean your first gig was or, well in college i don't think it was your first gig but you're playing with buddy rich right you were playing buddy yeah the rich. first my first road gig was was a, a brief stint with buddy rich and by the way tom garling was on the road with me oh, so was he? shout out oh, to him man. yeah we love tom my garling, favorite man he's the best favorite musicians in the world man and <laughs> not you know i mean one of my favorite trombone players beyond that yeah oh yeah so, no kidding well he I mean, was out there man well he's he's been on the road with a lot of different bands boy oh boy i didn't realize yeah. he was on the on the buddy band with um with you that's that's amazing yeah yeah, I lasted a couple of months, and then the, then there were four of us that came on the band, and they, and they fired all all four of us. And, uh, which, which for I those got... of you that are that, for those of you that think that that's weird, it it was Buddy Rich's band. It was not weird. I'm surprised you made four months because <laughs> I talked to people, and they're like, "Oh my god, it was crazy." <laughs> It was crazy, and of course, Mike Smith, another Chicago yeah, guy, sure. was was lead alto in that band, uh, second alto, excuse me, to Andy Fusco for a number of years oh, yeah. before he left to go with Sinatra. Yeah, right, exactly. So a lot of lot of lot of buddy alumni in Chicago land area. Well, well, what was but, that like when you got on that band? Because we're talking about people, you know, uh, <clears throat> tell me if 
you don't like absolutely hate what I'm playing, you know, like what Victor Lewis told you. I mean, <laughs> right, what was exactly. that like? Would Buddy tell you exactly like you suck? I mean, what I, are you playing? I, was that a good learning experience for I your even, first gig or was it like, oh, my God, this is a nightmare? It was everything. It was all of those <laughs> things. Um, <laughs> uh, listen, I wasn't going to go on the band. I was at I was at Eastman studying classical trumpet and. You know, I I needed to finish the year. I needed to, and they had asked me a couple of times to come on, mm -hmm. and uh, I said no a couple of times because I'd heard the stories about the, you know, yelling and stuff like that, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I frankly was just a little reticent to do it. And then they came to Monroe, Monroe College in Rochester where the school was, um, and it was like the last gig. And then there was two weeks off, mm -hmm. and then they were going to go back out. Come to the gig. If you don't, if you listen to the gig, meet Buddy. And if you if you like what you hear, so I had this like little backstage pass, you know, my twenty year old schoolboy look yeah. at looks and all that. And so I got the backstage pass, which put me over by his Chinese symbol, which was to the right off the bandstand backstage. Mm -hmm. And he started out with Wind Machine. Oh. Yeah. And it's just boom. And I just. I, I think I leapt off the ground about six or seven inches. <laughs> and then I was just looking for a phone because I needed to call my parents to tell them I was going on to be rich. I mean, that's, that's how amazing the energy was and what an incredible force of nature that man was. Yeah. So, um, you know, that, that's um, the kind of thing that wouldn't, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. That experience. I, I'm always curious because I mean, you have these experiences and outside of, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the not so fun part, but with that, with the band itself and that energy, you brought up that energy. I mean, and I know you've taught and you, you, you've been a professor at uh, university of Miami, I think, and a couple other universities and things. So you're, you're, you're dealing with a lot yeah. of younger students and students that are in college. These, this day and age, you don't get those experiences anymore as like a 19 or 20 or 21 year old to be able to go out with a band that is playing like top, you know, uh, massive amounts of uh, high energy stuff. You cannot phone anything in and it's from note one to the last note of the set. And if you're not hanging, you're not hanging. And it's, yeah. And you know, it's living on the bus and playing one nighters is what it is. And yeah. And that part of the industry has, has all but disappeared, unfortunately for, you know, I, you know, it's, um, it's, it's necessary for everything to evolve. So, it's time to move on to the next thing, I suppose, and find that energy in another form. Well, you're right, but though, there's... because that's the only way to get that 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 feeling, right, is get on the bus, get out, warm up a little bit, and bam, it's part. Of, it's it's go time, right? And then you get on yeah, the bus. Yeah, and it's just the, the routine part of it. That's really yeah. a big part of it, because you get comfortable, you know, and you have all that time to yourself sitting on the bus thinking about, you know, how you performed that night into the next day, and your life revolves around the two 45 minute sets yeah so right there just that focus yeah you know well, and everybody that, you can't help but be on the same page with folks you live on a bus with. yeah well yeah i mean but then but <laughs> it would then, behoove you <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly but i mean that kind of an experience and then you went back to school but then after school you got out and you went right back on the road again right who were you on the road with right out of school again um i decided i i really tried my best to become a college educator and as soon as i got in there i wanted to revolutionize jazz education because mm -hmm. i saw cats learning chord scale theory with the horns in their cases and stuff yeah and i thought oh man that's not that's really not the way to do it that's not the way that anybody did it and so i started you know ruffling some feathers <laughs> and realized the uh, the college <laughs> experience at least in those days were, was not going to be for me so um i moved on in 1995 moved from miami where i was living Mm -hmm. and just moved to New York City. Within about eight months, I got uh, a call to go play with Ray Charles, and I just I just jumped on it and did a year with him. Yeah. So yeah. the next year, I didn't go back. And um, That was a so lot. I mean, with Ray, I mean, with Ray, that, that's an intense situation, too. There's a lot of traveling and stuff involved and all that. So I would imagine after a year, you're probably like, okay, I need a little breather, right? Yeah, it was really crazy, and I I did want to I did want to come back and stay in New York, and but I needed that experience really bad. Mm -hmm. I needed there were so many things, and we could talk for three hours just on Mr. Charles alone. Um, but um, 
when I came back, I was lucky I didn't go back on the road because uh, I took an audition for Ray Barreto's small group mm-hmm. and um, got to be a member of New World Spirit for six years. Yeah. And that took me all over the world as well. But we're almost in the like the context of a Latin version of Art Blakey's band. Mm-hmm. So, which is exactly where I wanted to be. That's like that's like perfect for you. <laughs> it was like... perfect. It was perfect, <laughs> perfect situation. I adored Ray Barreto from playing in a band called La Moraya, which was which was a salsa band in, in uh, Rochester, but also from hearing his, him on a side man on you know records like So Much Guitar by West Montgomery, mm-hmm. and on and on and on. That list goes. He's actually on um, um, Skydive. Oh. And I had forgotten that he was actually on Skydive because he did all those those tracks for Atlantic in the 60s. From oh, wow. Tuesday. And I listened, about two years ago, I pulled out my LP of Skydive and put it on for a student. And I heard the conga sound. I said, holy, isn't, that's, that's Ray Barreto. <laughs> I had completely forgotten that Barreto was on that record. But with, after six years, you know, you hear sound for sure, yeah, a couple yeah, of yeah, seconds, yeah. you know, and it's like, oh, that's Ray. You yeah, know, that's his sound. What was that like going out on the road with with uh, you know you were on the road with 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 Buddy and and you know larger bands like that, but being on the road for six years consistent, right? So you're playing with somebody consistently for six years, and he's a legend. So I mean, you're going out and you're playing some of the prime, you know, jazz and Latin clubs and festivals and everything else throughout the world. Uh, but you're in a smaller group, and that group, especially with that type of music, I mean you guys had to really lock in. I mean, it had to be incredible. And, and I, I don't know if you could ever have that experience again in this day and age, right? I, you know, I, I would hope so. And I would strive to have that if I was a younger gentleman trying to get about, or a young lady trying to get about, you know, being a jazz musician in this 2021 environment. Mm-hmm. I'm, I would submit that it's, that it can be done. Hmm. Okay. I, I would say that, you yeah. know, uh, but we just have to reinvent ourselves, you know, Hey man, you know, well, I think, we're jazz I think, musicians. Uh, I think COVID, be... COVID-19 is helping to reinvent a lot of things in the music industry. So maybe, maybe that, uh, maybe this whole thing is going to come full circle and there are going to be groups like that, that play for longer periods of time together. But you know how difficult it is with jazz musicians to pin them down and have them stay in one band for a long period of time to really get that chemistry happening. Yeah. Sort of the day, day and age of projects. I, I get that. And, um, um, and I understand it as well. Um, it's, I always have sort of gone with the theory in the back of my head. I suppose, I suppose you could say it's over, overly optimistic, but that the more you starve human beings of the organic live interaction, witnessing the live orga- organic interaction of jazz musicians playing together, the more eventually there's going to be a demand for it. Mm-hmm. In other words, that pendulum is going to swing as well. And people are going to come back and they're going to have a yearning for it like they never did before. So I think you're right. I think I think you're right. And I know that you deal with a lot of different musicians during this COVID-19 situation. I'm sure you've had a lot of conversations and stuff and you're seeing a lot of the live stream and you're probably doing some online yep. or Zoom teaching or all of that. Oh, yeah. All the universities all went it. on. Right. But I mean, I, I, I feel like this day and age, and I'm curious to get your take on it because of all your experiences, but I think this day and age has, number one, the silver lining is going to come out is that there's a lot of musicians that are going to find their way around technology that they would have never found their way around technology just because they were used to teaching in person and playing gigs. So that might be a good thing where they can also figure out different ways to distribute their music and connect with a larger audience outside of their normal comfort zone. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. We've got to use technology. And, um, you know, there's some, there's some, some, some great opportunities to be had here. Um, and just don't discount, you know, people, you gotta be, you gotta, you gotta be creative and resourceful unless we forget, we are actually in a period of great, uh, prolific times in the world of jazz music. It's just not really being recognized or supported by the media in general, Mm -hmm. but it's happening. I mean, I'm in New York. You're creative musicians. Every time you go out, you get inspired. Mm-hmm. You hear somebody who plays circles around you, and not just technically either. You know, right. I mean, it's amazing what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. And Ira Sullivan, I gotta say, I gotta mention Ira because he's my mentor oh, and my main man. And I just talked to him the other day in Miami. He just turned 89. He's doing great. Mm-hmm. 
So he wants to shout out to everybody. Oh, that's awesome. In the Chicago land area, eighty nine years young. Isn't that amazing? You know, every time I see Ira when he's up here, because he always does the the jazz fest, and he's always up here playing uh, seven nights at the showcase and leading that's jam right. sessions and stuff. And yeah, you would never know he's eighty nine, man. Hey, he's a force of nature, man. And he used oh. to to drive me around in his silver Silverado down in Miami. <laughs> and he used to say to me, "Look, they've they've been prophesizing the end of jazz since there before there was a jazz, you know." Mm -hmm. And he would take me through it, you know. He's, if you can hear him too, right? You go, it's, first yeah. it was the wax cylinders, you know. Then it was the seventy eights. Then it was the war, you know. Then it was the big bands, or maybe not in that order. And then you know, he was, then he was, then it was Elvis. Then it was the Beatles. <laughs> And then he would always end with, but we're still here. We're still here. We're playing, you know. <laughs> so these people are in our midst, man. And this music is alive and well. Yeah. Through yeah. Ira, through through a kid in school, mm -hmm. you know, through people like uh, like Stacy Dillard, you know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I you know, and I, I also think that 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 live music thing, um, you know, from the technology point of view, you expand your audience, but then. There's nothing like seeing jazz specifically, or even Latin jazz, in a live setting. You you cannot get that feeling on YouTube, you know. No, man, and and that's really the conundrum. That's really that's really where the, the, the you, you've hit you've hit the nail on the head in terms of what the greatest challenge is. Yeah. And that is to try to use technology in such a way that we can actually play in different spaces electronically in real time live. Mm -hmm. um, I've been told that it's impossible by some, and I've been told that it is possible by others. Mm -hmm. And I could go into a whole technological spiel that my 16-year-old son has explained <laughs> to me why it's not possible. <laughs> but I think I'll spare you that <laughs> conversation. <laughs> it has to do with wires and where the relay system is and all that. Stuff. Oh yeah, with cloud so, and it goes latency. up and comes down. Latency, yeah, latency. But, yeah, latency, but, the, the evil enemy of the live musician. <laughs> But I think that's good, though, because it, it forces people to go and see it live. And the thing that I, you know, mm. it's almost like and I'm thinking about this lately, but it's almost like jazz. Right. If we're talking about jazz and Latin jazz and all that stuff. And then you have pop rock, you have, you know, all of those things, which actually, you know, and and hip hop and all that, which I love. I love all of that. But they can create beats. It can be electronic and they can do it and they can push it out. And it sounds fine. The live right. jazz thing or the Latin jazz or anything similar to that. You need to experience it in person. I was telling somebody, it's like, it's almost like what they always say about hockey. You know, you can watch hockey on TV, but boy, until you go and see it live, you're not getting the full effect of what that is. And yeah, it's almost like right. the same thing with jazz is that you can get a live stream performance. You can see this stuff, but then you walk into a jazz club, get the feel, get the smell, get the vibe. You walk in, get the lighting, you sit down, they start playing completely different experience and hopefully it, it that's really going to expand is. the audience out so people go and take a chance right that's right and and the of course the thing is that in this current situation i'm speaking of the pandemic of yep. course the the jazz musicians are hit hard and everyone else uh because we rely so heavily on, the, on playing with each other in mm -hmm. real time and um so you know you just got to hope for a vaccine or some kind of a, a way where we can be safe to go out and play with one another again um and the, when you go back to the other way of doing it, you can, while we're waiting, we can do all sorts of beautiful, creative things. Like if you go back to Brian Wilson mm -hmm. and the Beatles and Frank Zappa, these people were the pioneers of what I would call the one-way street where, you know, you have a drummer lay it down and then you've got a multi-track recording and you just layer that multi-track recording. And then you have a track that you're playing with. It, nobody's interacting with you, but you can put your two cents in and work with that track. Yeah. Then you can send that along to the next person. Of course, this is the been the way things have been being done really since the late sixties in pop music and most other genres. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's something we'll probably gonna have to embrace and make a make you know, make the best of while we wait. Well, and I think if jazz musicians get a hold of that concept, it's probably going to expand out really quickly because we're going to be looking at it completely differently than if we were thinking of it from one genre of music. So it's it's an exciting time, like what you said, and uh, you know, but we can't wait to get out and see live music again. That's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. For sure, man. For sure. You know, this is the first time in forty, at least easily forty years that I've gone 
more than even a couple of weeks without, you know, interacting live with another musician. Isn't that crazy, it's, man? It's, it's, been, it's been seven or eight weeks now. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really crazy. It's, uh, well, this yeah. is unprecedented. This has never happened before. And, and let's hope that Not we can make sure it never happens again once we get out of this whole situation. Hello. Thank you, Mike <laughs> Jeffries. Listen to those words. That's right. That's yes. right. Yes, sir. Well, I want to make sure we tell everybody to head over to johnbailey.com. We're going to link everything up as well. You've got to check out the new recording, Can You Imagine? And um, it's really, uh, hopefully, now that all of our viewers and listeners to the podcast and all that, hear the concept behind this they go and take a listen to this because now their ears will be open and they'll be listening to what john's been talking about and it makes it even more interesting to listen to because now you know the premise the concept and you can hear some of the themes that he talks about throughout the suite and 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 other tunes on this recording so congratulations on this recording john i really appreciate you jumping on today but i would be remiss if i didn't bring up uh you did a recording with well, first you played with Buddy Rich, one crazy drummer. You played another rec- you did another recording with another crazy drummer, Chicagoan, Bear Deems. <laughs> That's right. Who I who I got to know towards the end of his life, and he was probably just as crazy when you knew him as when I knew him. So how did that come awesome. about? <laughs> oh, he's crazy. Well, yeah, listen, he- two two words, two words, brother. Uh, Brad Good. Oh, no I went kidding. To high, I went to high school with Brad Good, and. Uh, East Lansing, Michigan. He was a senior when I was a freshman. Mm -hmm. He was friends with my sister who played trumpet. I knew him since I was 11. And when I came to Chicago during these, you know, professor professor days, you know, I would come up from Miami and do these clinics and stuff. And I was in Chicago and Brad said, why don't you come down to the elbow room? Remember the elbow room? Oh yeah. He played there every week. And and I played there with Barrett and he would do one of these, I mean, Barrett, was a virtuoso. Mm-hmm. He was the fastest drummer in the world. Brad used to take you, me to his house. He had <laughs> rare footage of Red Rodney playing with, with like, yeah. I mean, it was just amazing, you know, just mm-hmm. to just to be in the same room with this cat. And but the way he played was a whole other level, like the same level as Buddy Rich, but without the as much angst or there's just, there's something else going on there. Yeah. Of course, he was Louis Armstrong's drummer. So right. come on, man. Right. So yeah, that experience. So, so, so the routine was, and this is how the title of the album came about. Um, and I hope I can, I think I can say this word on the air. Um, he he would he would do one of this thing to do a press roll and go around the instrument and do his pyrotechnics, and he would stop, flap right down the <laughs> snare drum, right, and he and he turned to the band and he'd say, "How you like it so far?" And our line was, "Socks." <laughs> <laughs> and then he would play he would cue the last note and that yeah. was the end of the tune you know so that's barrett in a nutshell man and uh so that's the re- the album is called how do you like it so far yeah oh man that's great that's, that's <laughs> awesome i could you and i could tell bear deem stories probably for another <laughs> hour yeah i wouldn't be able to tell them you know well no none no, of us should tell they involve of explicit them. language <laughs> of course <laughs> He came into Andy's one night. You can appreciate this. And he comes into Andy's one night, and it was towards the end. And But I had known him for a while. I knew him from when he was playing at the Elbow Room. And he comes into Andy's, and I'm sitting there because somebody else was playing. And he comes up, and he punches me in the arm, and he sits down next to me. And I'm looking, and he's got a hospital bracelet on and an IV bag. I go, what are you Ooh. doing? He goes, ah, I was at the hospital for the past two weeks. I couldn't take it anymore. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Should you be here? <laughs> oh, man. He's like, don't worry, I'm not going to play tonight. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, Barrett, no problem. But you know, yeah, he just loved the music right? so much, man. He loved the music, and he and he just he wanted to be around it constantly. And that's what I remember about him too, man. He was, you know, he's incredible. You must have been been in that. You must have played that band. Frank Catalano was in that band. I don't know. If that's was, right. He sure was, man. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. used to play with Frank all the time too. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of Chicago connections with uh, with your background. I love it. There are a ton of them, and uh, you know, I love Lincoln Ave and I love DePaul. And- I played with Ed Palermo for years, and and Ed's a DePaul graduate, mm-hmm. and of course Ira, and you know the list goes on. Yeah, I really, I really love the Chicago land area, and you want to see how deep it goes for me. My first trip ever from East Lansing on a train by myself was into Union Station to meet my grandmother. My grandmother lived in Deerfield, mm-hmm. and my grandfather uh, was a physics teacher at Near Trier High School. 
Oh, no kidding. <laughs> no kidding, man. <laughs> so it runs deep. My father was born in Normal, Illinois. Oh, that's awesome. So, that's, well, yeah. then you know the area. So hopefully when all this stuff calms down, we'll get you in over to the Jazz Showcase or the Green Mill or something, and we can see you perform live here in Chicago at some point. That'd be awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun. I'd love to revisit Chicago. It's been too long. Yeah. Well, John, yeah, thanks man. thanks for jumping on today, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. And, and uh, congratulations on the new recording. And, you know, everybody head over to johnbailey.com. And, uh, you know, like I said, hopefully we'll see you here live in Chicago sooner rather than later. And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll bring Brad Good back and you guys could have a reunion concert or something. Oh, man, that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> That would be a lot of fun. Hey, listen, and I would re be remiss, Mike Jeffers, if I didn't say happy birthday to you. Oh, man. thank you. Yes. Happy birthday to Mike <laughs> Jeffers, to you and yours and all of your fans. Well, I appreciate you saying that very much. I've got a wild evening planned. I'm planning on going outside and sitting on my patio uh, deck and, and uh, drinking a half a glass of wine. So it's going to get nuts. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and if you feel like having a second half, don't, don't worry about it. All right. Since you said you so, my Don, I'm man. drinking a full glass of wine tonight, man. It's over. All right. <laughs> hey, thanks, John. Go Take care. to bed. That's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Take care. Stay uh, safe. And uh, hopefully we'll see you here in Chicago uh, once everything breaks loose uh, with the COVID-19 and we can all get back to normal. Yeah, from your mouth to God's ears, my man. Yeah, right. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank right. you so much, man. Take, Take care. care. All right. Bye. John Bailey. Wow. You know, what a super nice guy. I'm telling you, and his recording, I'm, you will be not – what am I trying to say? You won't be – disappointed the recording it's really man it, it, there's a lot of different genres a lot of different styles incorporated in there but that's his playing that's his voice and I, hopefully by listening to what um you know his description of the recording and the whole concept behind it you got something out of it and you can go check it out johnbailey.com tomorrow we have got a, an action-packed show tomorrow we're starting early we're going to be doing 5 30 p.m start time we're going to have Darren Scores and Michelle Thomas on previewing their live performance live stream at 7 p 7.30 p.m. tomorrow night. So that is going to be at 5.30. And then at 6 o'clock, we're finally going to get to sit down and talk with, well, virtually, unfortunately. Matt Ullery is going to be on. We've been trying to connect. We've been trying to do an interview, a feature interview for the magazine, COVID-19 hit. Everything got shut down as far as that goes, but we're going to have Matt on. We're going to talk all about his career, all about his incredible uh, recordings, compositions, performances, his recording label, his record label. We've had a couple of artists that he has on the label on in the past. So it'll be great to actually have the person running the label on and a whole lot more. So that's going to be tomorrow at 6. So we've got 5.30, Michelle Thomas, Darren Scorza, 6 p.m., Matt Ullery, and... Uh, you know, what can I say? We're going to have a jam-packed. We've got a great week coming up as well. I'm going to announce all of that stuff. But we've got a base summit with Frank Russell on Friday. And Daryl Jones from the Rolling Stones is going to be joining us, along with Chuck Webb and Bear Williams and a host of other bases. That's our Friday night, Friday summit. And, uh, man, oh, man, I can't even I, I can't even remember right now. It, I'll announce everything a little bit later on tonight. Of course, you can see all the past episodes at Chicago musicrevealed.com, chicagojazz.com. And of course, I'm also the program director at the Epiphany Center for the Arts. So check out epiphanyshy.com for all of our upcoming performances. We're going to be launching things starting in September. So you want to get on the mailing list so you can get all of the discounts and all of the special pre-order ticketing op opportunities for our fall season. So check all that stuff out. All right. I appreciate everyone giving me the happy birthday uh, love here. I've seen my Facebook feed is blowing up, which I cannot, you know, thank everyone enough. I'm going to go through and thank everyone personally, but I'm telling you right now on the show. And of course I see some of my favorite people there chiming in on the comments, giving me a happy birthday throughout the uh, interview. So thank you so much. I am going to go and chill out now. So hopefully everybody has a good evening. Stay safe. Stay inside, of course, tomorrow night, right here, 5.30 p.m., and we're going to have a great show tomorrow night. But until then, stay safe, stay inside. Let's hope all of this stuff ends soon so we can get back to 
a wonderful city of Chicago and chill out and all of us can work together. All right, stay safe. Until tomorrow, I will see you at the next broadcast.